Well, here we are in chapter 15 of Jeremiah. This is the continuation of the conversation between God and Jeremiah about the famines and destructions that are happening to the people at this time. So this chapter is picking up with God answering what Jeremiah was asking at the end of chapter 14. So if you haven't watched that video, that'll give you more context for what's going to be in this video as well. So verse 1, Then said the Lord unto me, so again, this is God answering what Jeremiah asked for at the end of the last chapter. Now you may be saying, but Curtis, why is this broken into two chapters? Why couldn't we have made this one larger, larger chapter? That's possible. There is some possibility that, that could have been there. There's probably a scribal reason in how they set these up a long time ago that said, we're going to break this conversation up. If you look for those little paragraph symbols, those P symbols, you'll realize that's where they used to be broken up and then they've changed them. So there's no P between end of 14 and, and start of 15. So these chapters were broken up different, basically, in, in the ancient world, some of the more ancient documents. So just realize our modern way of breaking up chapters doesn't match up with the way it used to be broken up before. So this probably was one long chapter, and they said, this is too long, we're going to break it, because I think this took three, three chapters in the King James Version for this whole conversation to happen. Verse 1, Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. That is a big no. So when Jeremiah is praying, God, we need your help. Please help us. And God's going, you know what? You can, re you can get Moses. If you got Moses... And Samuel, two great ancient prophets, to come before me today and plead, I still would say no. Wow. That put Jeremiah in his place, probably. Just thinking about that. That's amazing. Now, verse 2. And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee... So, remember, in the last chapter, there was a section of this conversation where God said, this is what you need to go tell the people. So, now he's, he's saying... if. Depend on what they re if they respond this way, here's what you do. Uh, verse 2, It shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then shalt th thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Now that may sound confusing to, to go through that. This is... We're not given a lot of details, but what we're told basically is, here are your options, okay? Basically, do you want to just die by the sword? Do you want to die by the famine? It's up to you. Which do, which do you want to do, basically? So the problem is, there isn't an option to not die, <laughs> Basically, if you look at that, they're all going to die. Okay. Now, there are some that will be captive. That's true. That they, Those people won't die necessarily during this, but, you know, they'll, they'll live their life in captivity. Uh, so these are your options, folks. So this is, in a way, the, the probably the easiest way to think about verse 2 is to think about God going, look, you made your choice. Here's the options that are left over because of the choices you've made in the past. This is the result of your, this is the consequence you're getting. You made your bed. You got to sleep in it now, basically. That's, that's probably the easiest way to think of verse 2. Now verse 3, And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord. Now kinds in the Hebrew means destroyers. So four destroyers will be sent uh, over these people. The sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So mankind, just killing is the sword. Dogs, eating injured, wounded people. Uh, the fowls of heaven, so like vultures and things coming in. And the beasts of the earth, which are probably your lions, bears, those kinds of things coming in. You know, which one do you want? You got four ways to die. Which one do you want? That's kind of what he's saying, basically. These are the people that will be, I'm going to send and they're going to annihilate you. Verse 4, I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth, which is scattered, being removed into the other kingdoms. They're being moved around. 
because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, Manasseh, he was a king. He was the king after Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king during uh, Isaiah's time. Manasseh is the one that killed Isaiah. He, Manasseh is the one that, you know, Isaiah was righteous and wanted to bring the people back to God. Manasseh went, no, we're doing idol worship and went way into idol worship. And then Josiah was after him who tried to bring it back and then it didn't work. So, uh, that's, so be, because Manasseh basically turned everybody against God, this is, this is part of the problem, part of the problem. So not a good situation for them to be in, basically. Verse 5, For who shall have pity on thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask thee how doest? Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. Now verse 5 and 6 go right together because this is going, Who's to blame Jerusalem for the destructions you have basically who should have pity on you everybody else is going dude the god of your land is not the god you're worshiping you're worshiping everybody else's god no wonder the god of the land punished you you need to follow the god of your land which is your god but you're following everybody else's gods so who's to blame you're the one that made the choices you're now suffering the consequences of that so realize verse 6 is about judgment. It's about justice. Let's deal with the consequences of the situation. They've already made their choice. Now the consequences are going to follow that, basically. There's nothing they can do about it. Verse 7, And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. Okay, this is them, is the children of Israel, basically, of Judah. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. Now, when we think of fanning them in the gates of the land, what we're talking about is winnowing. This is the, the idea when you get when you grow wheat, there's the, the chaff that's on the outside of them. So you have to break that up. So you beat them, basically get, a, get like a kind of like a rake, and you turn it upside down, you smash them on the ground a whole bunch, and then you toss it in the air. And as the wind blows, it blows all the, the light chaff away and the heavy wheat berries drop to the ground, basically. So he's going to sift and sort these people and then bereave them of children. They are going to lose a whole generation, basically. Now realize there, there were two, technically three Babylonian exiles, two major ones we know the most about. Uh, and that's probably what verse 7 is referencing is these exiles. So in, in 597, like we'd mentioned earlier, 597, when Babylon, just shortly after Babylon comes through to, to kick out Assyria and kind of take over the land from Assyria, uh, they, ex, they exiled a whole bunch of like artisans and wealthy people and government people into Babylon. Ezekiel, the prophet, we're going we're gonna to get into his book here in pretty soon. He was one of those that went. Uh, they went off to be a part of that first exile, basically. Uh, but then there was the second one in 587. This, was, this is the one we hear of the most when we think of the de destruction of Jerusalem. That uh, This is the one where like Jerusalem gets destroyed. This was the time of King Zedekiah. All of that's wiped out, and then a huge amount of people are moved to, Jeru or moved to Babylon from Jerusalem. Basically, that's the major exile. And then technically... There's another one a little bit later on that we, we, uh, we'll learn about, but the 587 was the main one we hear most about. Uh, now in verse 8, their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. Think of every grain of sand representing a widow. That is a lot of men dying and dead. The men are going to be destroyed because they were all fighting and they're all going to be wiped out basically. So a whole lot of men taken in the exiles as well as killed in the battles. That's the population shift, you know, men versus women is going to make a big difference. There's going to be a whole lot of women for every man. 
because of this destruction that's that's going to happen basically um i have continuing with verse 8 i have brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday i have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city now this is really interesting to cause them to come at noonday so the enemy's coming during the day like a main part of the day brightest part of the day to go an attack. It's going to be a sudden swift attack. They're, Israel's not going to see it coming, basically. So this is really interesting because most of the time when you're fighting, they didn't have flashlights. They didn't have torches. They didn't have lights like we would today to fight at night. They didn't have night vision goggles or thermal sensors or anything like that. So it was really hard to fight at night. Uh, you Your attrition rate as far as like uh, they call it blue on blue today or green on green, the you know friendly fire type idea would happen a lot more at night in these days because there's no way to tell who you're really fighting so a lot of times what armies would do is they would march in and basically spend the night and then the next morning they'd get up in the morning and then fight so they'd get up they would fight in the morning go all day long and then stop fighting in the evening and go back to their camps basically that was very common but Babylon is just going to show up in the middle of the day. They don't care. They're not looking for a major competitive advantage. They know they're all they're already just being there is their advantage. And they're going to take them over, basically. So Judah's not going to be ready. They're not going to be ready for it. They're not going to be, they're going to caught, be caught completely off guard with having uh, Babylon march in on them. So they're not worried about trying to get the advantage of having the most sunlight for the day to get them. They're going to just come in at noon and wipe them out because they know they can. They can take out Judah and there's no problem. Uh, now, verse 9, She that hath borne seven languageth. She hath given up the ghost. Her son is gone down while it was yet day. She hath been ashamed and confounded, and the residue of them will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. The 9 sounds kind of interesting because it's, talking about she, so female, we're, we're coming from a now a feminine perspective of a person uh, who has born seven children, basically like seven sons. Uh, in fact, uh, Thompson in his book of Jeremiah, he said, to be a mother of seven sons was to enjoy a great blessing. If you look at the traditions and cultures, seven sons, that's phenomenal. You're going to have, they bring blessings to your family because they're all going to get married and they're all going to bring their wives with them. So that's going to double your family to 14 plus you and your husband. So you'll be at 16 in the household, which means you can farm more land. You can grow. You can have more wealth. And then they'll have children as well that will continue to expand. So sons were blessed. Okay, But as Thompson says, but this would become a curse when her son, that is this group of sons, was taken away at noonday. So her son, if you notice in verse 9, her son is not S-O-N, but S-U-N. The light of her day, her children, which is a benefit to her, are all gone, wiped out. Uh, and it's at noonday. They're taken just as Babylon comes in. They're all wiped out. Like, it just, this is going to happen so fast, it's going to be uh, mind-boggling. So, before the life of these young men was half spent in their noonday and the full strength of manhood, they were lost in battle leaving the household with no future heir. So this now, this woman who's gone from, I'm married, I have a man that helps me out and does things. I have seven sons to do things. This is great prosperity for me and my family. I now have no man in my life. They're all dead. They're all gone. That puts her in a destitute situation. So, but as if such a tragedy as this particular one were not enough, any remaining men of Judah would perish by the sword at the hands of their enemies. It was a grim picture of the fate that had already befallen Jerusalem, the mother, the city of Judah. So this is kind of seeing, uh, while we're telling the story of a woman who has gone from having wealth to basically being destitute, uh, this is also symbolically talking about the city of Jerusalem having, she has people, she has assets, but now they're all going to be destroyed and gone basically. Uh, in fact, verse 9, woe is me, my mother. So, so this is really interesting. Verse 10 is, is kind of interesting because this is now Jeremiah. This isn't God responding. This is Jeremiah, if I remember right. 
Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. So verse 10 is this insight that we get from Jeremiah that we don't get through the prophets. And we're now learning what Jeremiah is thinking inside. He is really depressed. He's going, oh man, you know, why did I have to be born? Why did my mother give birth to me so that I can live in a crazy time like this? He's like, I'm trying to be honest in integrity with people. They're trying to be honest in integrity with me. But yet I'm still getting blamed and cursed by people and have all these problems and things. I did nothing against them, but they're doing things against me. So he's feeling pretty down about his life and his existence, basically, at this point. Uh, verse 11, the Lord is now going to come into this conversation that this, you know, Jeremiah is thinking about these things himself. God's going to step into this conversation. He's going to, he's going to say, the Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. So he is getting reassurance from God. Jeremiah is getting this reassurance. God's like going, look, don't worry, Jeremiah. Things will be okay. You know, it's interesting. He's, he's basically saying, I can't promise you deliverance. I can't promise you you're not going to experience tragedy and problems with this. But I can help you through the tragedies and the challenges, basically. In fact, verse 12, shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? So weapons of Judah were not of the higher quality their enemies brought. That's basically what verse 12 is getting at. This is realizing that, you know, I, 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 this is God basically telling Jeremiah, look, I'm not going to stop. The destruction is coming. They're not, the you know, Judah's not prepared, but they're not asking me for help. They're asking the false gods for help. They've gone away from me. They've tied my hands, basically. Uh, God wants to help them and bless them, but he's limited because they aren't talking to him. They're not repenting. They're not coming to him, basically. Verse 13, thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price that for all thy sins, even in all thy borders. And I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, which shall burn upon you. So this is, again, Jeremiah, he's like, look, I can't say you're going to escape the calamities that are coming, Jeremiah. You'll probably suffer. You're going to experience pain and suffering and problems just like the, the rest of the people. But I will make a way that you can survive this. It will work out in the long run for you. So don't worry. Basically, that's this is kind of what God tells us when we have major problems and challenges and things is, you know, I can't, I can't stop your choices. I can't stop the consequence of your choices. Might be a better way to say it. But I can help you make it through. God's here to help us make it through. Uh, verse 14, and I will make them, thee to pass. Oh, sorry, I just read that one. Verse 15. O Lord, so this is Jeremiah now commenting back to God. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. So it is, it is absolutely clear. Kent Brown said this about Jeremiah. He said, it is absolutely clear both from this and from earlier passages that he had suffered severe persecution. And we know that some of it came from his family and old associates in Anathoth. So he, we know that. We know that, I mean, people have sought to kill him. There's been a lot that he's been, they are trying to assassinate Jeremiah. They're trying to get him knocked off and get him off to the, out of the way, basically. And he's deal, having to deal with this. So in here, though, now if you, you remember, too, we've got to realize that he was not allowed by God to be a part of the community. So he was seen as separate and was persecuted for being different. That is one of the challenges that happened was, remember, he was told not to indulge in grief with everybody else when you lose a loved one. Don't follow the traditions and customs of the people. So that kind of made Jeremiah stand out separate from the people, uh, which the people didn't like. That just gave more reasons to hate Jeremiah, basically. 
Now, verse 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So that's Jeremiah talking, again, his, his response back, going, God, you help me. I've internalized your words. I'm doing the best I can with what you've given me. Uh, in fact, Kent Brown also said on this verse, he said uh, in his uh, the history of Jeremiah's faith crisis, one can imagine Jeremiah remembering the joy and happiness which came to him when he was first called to be a spokesman to God's people. But after mentioning that this event effectively set him apart from others, he wrote a gloomy confession of his frustration since his call. So that's that's the challenge here is, you know, I'm sure when Jeremiah was called to be the prophet, he's like, oh my gosh, this is like an amazing honor God has given me to, to represent him and do this. And now he's realizing, oh my gosh, this is hard. This is not, you you know, you never want to be the prophet during the bad part of that pride cycle down on the bottom of the corner. You want to be the prophet at the top where you're going, yes, the people are repenting. Let's do better. Let's be a prophet in a good time, not a prophet in a bad time. Uh, Verse 17, continuing on here, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Uh, So that's what we were were talking about earlier. Now, uh, verse 18, Why is my pain perpetual, and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar, and as waters that fail? So here, what Jeremiah is mentioning is, mentioning his, his injury, which seemingly could not be healed, Jeremiah dared to refer to God as failing waters. Jeremiah is frustrated. That's a big deal here. He's really frustrated with what's going on. So in a word, and this is this is Kent Brown, by the way, saying this, in a word, the prophet was distressed. What had gone wrong? Significantly, this out, outburst led the Lord generously to reconfirm Jeremiah's prophetic calling, almost, as we noted earlier, in the very words of his original commission. So this is now verse 19. God's going to come back and reassure Jeremiah. So verse 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord, If thou return, then will I bring thee again. If thou shalt stand before me, and thou shalt stand before me, and if thou take forth the precious from the vile, thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. So let them return to me, they need to come to me. It's not you going to them. They need to come to me. And you need to come, make sure you're doing what's right to come to me too. So really what that says is, I will be that one righteous person to have you help us, basically. Let them change. Let them come. It's it's They're the ones that walked away from me, so they're the ones that need to walk back, basically. But I'm, I will be here to help you, Jeremiah. And you're here to help the people through me, and I will support you in this as well. Verse 20, I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So again, God is going, I'm here to help you. I'll make you like a fenced brazen wall. So this is a big wall that is metal. So the odds that they'll get through it is so slim that Jeremiah doesn't have to worry. God will protect him and take care of him. It's not going to be easy. They're still going to come after you, but they will not be successful, basically. So verse 21, And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. So this is good news for Jeremiah. Not so good news for the people, unfortunately, in this conversation. Now there's more to this conversation that we're going to see as we get into the next chapters. We continue this longer conversation, basically. So Let's jump over there and see the rest of this.